What's up guys, if you're interested in getting sweet altars like these every month, you can do so by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com slash it resolves. What's going on guys and welcome to another episode of the crack a pack series. I hope you all are doing super super well. I'm doing very very fantastic today. If you haven't already checked out our Patreon, I'm not going to harp on it, but you definitely should check it out. We've revamped the entire thing. Uh, you probably saw a quick little ad at the beginning of this video. Definitely, definitely check that out. I think it's much more worthwhile now, and I hope you guys enjoy what we have to offer there. Uh, but today, we are opening up a pack of Chronicles, which is not something that we get to do very often. I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, Chronicles is kind of notoriously known as one of the sets that slightly killed uh value for a lot of uh, a lot of cards uh and so it not at the time i will say it was not very well received i think even still uh it's not really one of the best received sets uh just because it was entirely reprints all white border which people tend not to like uh but it is still an interesting set lots of really good cards in it uh it's just they're white bordered they're reprints people don't care as much about them uh we actually opened up our first card here. We are going to go through this uh, as if it's a draft setting. So we're going to hopefully be able to determine what our first round draft pick would be. I did not play during this time. I have no clue what all is in this set. But we do start off with Arcadius Sabbath. Uh, it's two, two white, two blue, and two green uh, for an Elder Dragon Legend. That is a 7-7. Seven, seven. It has flying. As long as they are not attacking... Uh, as long as they are not attacking, untapped creatures you control get plus zero, plus two. And then during your upkeep, you have to pay white, blue, and green, or you have to uh, sacrifice, bury, in old terms, uh, Arcadia Sabbath. Uh, and then you can pay a white, and it gets plus zero, plus one until the end of the turn. Uh, my assumption is this is our rare for the pack, by the way, uh, and this is a very, very powerful card. However, it is a very mana intensive card. I think you still would want this. I think it's still worth uh, that mana cost. It's just really, really difficult to get to, but it is a late game card. So having that multicolor uh, tag on to a late game card is much easier than getting it on like an early play uh, where you really, really need to get that mana early. Uh, in this in this instance, you have a lot of time to actually get to that mana cost, so it's 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 a little bit easier than it would be if it was a lower casting card. This is very much a bomb. Uh, that boost uh, to all of your uh, non-attacking creatures, uh, specifically untapped creatures, uh, is really really nice because it's just going to mean they're going to survive combat a lot more often than they normally would. The upkeep cost is obviously pretty un unfortunate, but if you're already paying for a card like this, you're planning on winning the game with it. So it's worthwhile to keep around. And then adding that little uh, kind of reverse fire breathing where you add toughness to this uh, for one white is perfectly fine. You probably won't use it very often, but it does get around certain things. So it's worthwhile having overall very, very fun card. Definitely uh, a really strong pick off the bat. That being said, it is obviously mana intensive, so keep that in mind. Uh, Wall of Opposition is a is uh, a zero six, excuse me, for three and two red, and then you can pay a one and it get plus one plus zero until the end of the turn. Worth noting, it is a wall, and though it does not say it here, uh, walls do just assuming have defender. Uh, basically, walls can't attack is the idea. So uh, this is very much a blocker. It's a very late game blocker. I don't like this very much because it just doesn't deal any damage. However, it does have the clause where you can tie in a little bit of damage with it if you are blocking something uh, by just paying one of any color, which I like quite a lot. Uh, normally, walls are really bad because of that. This kind of gets around it, but it is very mana intensive. You're sinking a lot of mana into a 0-6 right off the bat. Uh, and then being able to actually kill off a creature with it means you're going to have to sink in even more and more mana uh, throughout the turns. Don't really love that, to be honest. Uh, it's definitely not better than uh, Arcadius here, but it's an interesting card. I Creatures were generally underpowered during this time, so it's not too surprising that this is here, but uh, I don't love it, honestly. Uh, the Fallen is a 2-3 for 1 and 3 black. Uh, during your upkeep, the Fallen deals 1 damage to each opponent it has previously damaged. That is an interesting card. 
Uh, and actually, I think a very, very strong one. So if you get in with an attack, you don't actually have to... I mean, you still want to further attack, obviously, but it's still going to be dealing damage to the opponent regardless, uh, assuming that it's dealt damage prior. So I actually really like this card. If it wasn't for the Arcadius, I think this would definitely be the pick so far. Uh, it's just it encourages that aggression. It is a little expensive and three black is a little bit difficult, but I think it's worth it here. I think being able to stick something that ideally deals multiple uh, points of damage every turn, regardless of uh, attacking or anything like that, I think that's worth it. You obviously have to attack once and deal some damage uh, with the creature, but after that, it's still going to continuously just ping them every turn. Uh, and I like that. So I think it's worthwhile. Not better than Arcadius, but still a very good card. Uh, Urza Tower is one of the three Tron lands, uh, in fact, probably the most powerful. Uh, so it is a land you can tap it and add one colorless to your mana pool uh, in, new in new terms that is generic. Uh, if you control Urza's Mine, Urza's Tower, and Urza's Power Plant, instead it adds three colorless or generic mana to your mana pool instead of one. Uh, so the idea here is you get all three Tron lands out, uh, as they have been affectionately named, uh, and then you can just t have tons of mana to do really, really crazy things. If you don't play modern, uh, the Tron deck in modern is really, really powerful. Uh, you get things like Karn Liberated on turn three, which is insane. It's really, really powerful. Uh, obviously, it's not super consistent, but there are a lot of cards to help make that possible. Unfortunately, in draft, not so much. It's very worth. It's very worth noting you may just not pull all the Trod lands, so it's really not worth it in that instance. If you happen to get them, maybe you can run them if you're in a very colorless focused strategy. Uh, but generally, you're going to want colored mana in draft because you're probably going to be splashing some colors, might have multiple colors. In this case, we're already starting off in three, most likely. So uh, pulling something like this just really doesn't help you that much. Uh, Flash Flood is an instant for one blue. Destroy target red permanent or return target mountain to its owner's hand. Uh, this is something, it, it's very common in these older sets to see cards like this, which are so, so hateful towards a particular color. In this case, obviously, it's red. It's the opposite of blue. That tends to be the case. Uh, straight up destroying a red permanent for only one blue mana at instant speed is insane. That is such good value. Uh, bouncing a mountain is also decent tempo, but obviously not as good. It's really not the effect you want to be using uh, off of this card, but still very, very good. It's a great tempo play. Cards like this are amazing in the sideboard. They're not great just main board because obviously you don't know if you're going to be against a red deck or a blue deck or any other kind of deck. So having a really, really focused, specific card uh, that hates on a particular color is never a good idea to main board. But having this as a sideboard option, fantastic. You absolutely would want this if you are in blue. Uh, definitely not first pickable. It's not a reason to be there, but definitely worthwhile if you already are. Uh, Boomerang is two blue for an instant return target permanent to its owner's hand. This is a very, very classic card uh, and a very, very good one. It's one that just gives you tempo. I mean, it's very straightforward. For two mana, you bounce any permanent. It can be a land, it can be an artifact, enchantment, creature, anything that you want that is a permanent can be bounced with this card. It's instant speed, so you can do it at the time that's best uh, for you. And so if you need to leave up a card and they maybe a counter of some kind uh, and they don't play anything super, super relevant, you can just boomerang something back, gain that tempo, and then be able to set yourself up for the next turn. Really, really good. Definitely a powerful card and one that I would be interested in, again, if it wasn't for Arcadius, which is honestly probably going to be the pick. Let's just be honest. But very, very good card. Uh, Bog Rats is a 1-1 one, one for 1 black, and it can't be blocked by walls. So... Normally, I don't really care about walls, uh, and honestly, even in this format, I probably wouldn't care too much about walls, but the fact that this can't be blocked by walls in a set where walls are very prevalent, pretty good. Uh, it is still a 1-1 one, one for 1. You're not going to be winning the game with a card like this, most likely, uh, but it does get around a sizable chunk of the creature base uh, during this time. There were a lot of walls in this set. And I do seem to remember a lot of people playing walls during this time just because they did stall the game. It lets you get to your bigger bombs, which was pretty good at that time. So getting around that is actually worth noting in this set. Still not amazing. It is just a 1-1 one, one for 1 that's conditionally unblockable. So it's not super ideal, but it's not a bad 1-drop. Uh, Scavenger Folk 
is a 1-1 one, one for one green. You can pay a green, tap it, and sacrifice it to destroy target artifact. This is a much better one drop in my opinion because it does uh, just kind of have built in tech. It's a one one for one regardless. So it's it's on curve. It's not amazing, but it is a one drop. And then you have that added tech of being able to take away an artifact on the opponent's side of the field if you want to or any artifact technically. But uh, being able to have that built into your deck, uh, especially in the early turns or something like turn one even. Uh, that's pretty good. I mean, it's not amazing. It probably isn't going to be super relevant, but we see it nowadays with things like Thrashing Brontodon, where it's a three drop that you can pay a mana and destroy target artifact or enchantment by sacrificing it. It's just a good card to have in your deck. It's great to have that tech available to you. You may not need it, but it's great to have. So if you're looking for a green kind of techie early game card, this is fantastic. Uh, definitely playable no matter what, but also has that added bonus for sure. Uh, Goblin Shrine, uh, enchant land for one and two red, and as long as the land uh, is a mountain, all goblins get plus one, plus zero. If, if the Goblin Shrine leaves play, it deals one damage to each goblin. Uh, this is a really interesting card. Uh, in draft, it's definitely better than if it was uh, maybe constructed, just because it's probably easier to take away uh, the enchantment or the land uh, in constructed than it is in draft. It's probably pretty difficult in draft. Uh, but if you're in a goblin stack, it's great. If not, then it's completely useless. So it's not much to talk about, if I'm going to be honest. But uh, if you're in the goblin stack, go for it, I suppose. It's probably fine in there. Uh, Metamorphosis is a sorcery for one green. Sacrifice a creature to add an amount of mana equal to its casting cost plus one to your mana pool. Uh, this mana may be of any uh, one color, excuse me, and use this mana only to cast summon spells. If you don't know what that means, that just means creatures. Uh, summon was kind of the old term for it. Uh, I don't love this card. I don't think it's that good. It does gain you, gain you excuse me, a little bit of tempo technically uh, if, you're, if you're really, really uh, looking at the value of the creature. But it's all dependent on the creatures that you have, and I'd much rather have just strong creatures and not metamorphosis than metamorphosis without the strong creatures. So I'm not interested in first picking this. There are instances maybe where I would take it, but it doesn't seem like my kind of card. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Living Armor is an artifact for four mana. You can tap it and sacrifice it to put plus zero plus X counter on target creature where X is equal to that creature's casting cost. Uh, interesting card for sure. I don't love it. Uh, the boost to toughness, while definitely relevant in keeping creatures around a bit longer, doesn't actually help you win the game most of the time. Long term, obviously, you're keeping your creatures around. Technically, it'll help you win the game that way, but... Uh, you're not dealing any extra damage. You're not doing anything directly that's that's really going to blow out the board by any means. And so a card like this is a big investment for something that I don't think is worth it. Uh, there are definitely instances where it's going to be good because it's going to keep your creatures around. But very rarely do I ever really want an effect like this in a draft deck. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. Uh, and our last card here is Remove Soul. It is an interrupt, which is just an instant for one in a blue counter target summon spell. Again, we just said that is a creature spell. Uh, this is actually a very, very efficient counter uh, in draft. Again, generally in draft, you're going to run into creatures more than uh, spells of any other kind. Generally speaking, I should say. Uh, and so having a straight up counter to the majority of the stuff that you're going to run into is always really, really good. For two mana, being able to leave that up early just means you can get tempo in the early game, or you can just have straight up counters for the late game when they're about to drop a bomb. So all in all, very, very powerful counter. Definitely one I'd be interested in, but very easy Arcadis uh, for me. Uh, I don't think that there's really any competition. The Elder Dragon cycle is really, really powerful, even at this time. Uh, and so it just seems like a no-brainer. But if you disagree with me, please let me know in the comment section below. Uh, and as always, uh, please make sure to like or comment down below as well if you enjoyed this video. Also, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack a Back episode.